This program has been made possible by a grant from the UCF Office of Research and Commercialization. The UCF Office of Research and Commercialization is committed to moving the discoveries of our faculty and students from ideas to innovation to realization. By moving research from the laboratory to the private sector, we are helping to diversify Florida's economy and helping to bring high paying jobs to our state. This program presents some examples of our research and our efforts to transition this research to the private sector. Welcome once again to another edition of Zenith. I'm your host, Ed Hyland, and today our look into the world of research lights up the program with lasers. We also ask the question, can interactive games be a way to train future soldiers? These stories and much more coming up on Zenith. The UCF Business Incubation Program is a university-driven community partnership. Entrepreneur Magazine says Orlando has one of the most highly coordinated entrepreneurial engines in the country, and it all started with the UCF Business Incubation Program. The goal is to get something out in, in the marketplace or get something published or patented that really uh, benefits society. Providing companies with the enabling tools to create financially stable, high-growth enterprises. Video games became all the rage in the 90s, but today's games must do more. They must be interactive, tell a story, and really immerse the player in a decision-making process. It wasn't a big leap for the military to realize what a valuable tool interactive games could be for training young men and women. But the testing program at UCF was also a way to see how best to develop training techniques for youth between 11 and 18 years of age. The project was called Lunar Lunge and it had a big long name that had to do with looking at adolescents ages 11 to 18 and how they would react given the same game but playing the game under two radically different in, in environments. If you look at you look at uh, research today, you're looking at things that are going three and five years. So if I'm going to look at the next generation of 18 year olds and 19 year olds, we want to take a look at the kids today and see how are they working with augmented reality. One being a desktop version, normal keyboard and mouse. Gamers would do much better than non-gamers. Okay, we understand that. Let's switch it over to a environment like I'm standing in the middle of now, a mixed reality environment, where all of a sudden the normal gaming conventions of using my thumbs and my fingers don't really mean anything. I, I don't need to have my arms, my, my, my fingers and my thumbs in order to move through this world. What I have to do is walk. If I want to go over there, I need to walk over there. I need to walk over here. If I want to open a door, I need to use my arm and open the door. So the concept was, would, that, would this environment make a difference in the success of non-gamers being able to step right into a scenario and do it. You have two different types. One is what's called head-mounted display, which you're virtually completely enclosed in the environment and then all your senses are being fed there. Mixed reality allows you to almost put on like a pair of sunglasses 
And what you're doing is you're using kind of like a Hollywood technique. They used to be called the green rooms or the blue rooms and projected onto those walls or the objects or the images you want that person to see. So you're augmenting his environment instead of actually fully virtually putting him into an environment. We're all conditions for different things. When we came up in our world, we were working with the Pong, you know, the old video game. Now kids today, are their reactions are different. They're taught in school differently. They're actually taught educationally using uh, video games or video type applications and stuff. So how in this environment can we look at their reactions? And based on that information, how can I modify training systems in the future to be able to maximize the use of that uh, information and stuff? I did have a challenge when we first looked at saying we want to test adolescence, and it is sponsored by the Army. Um, the Army and the military in general have made tremendous research possible. A lot of the things that we take into civilian research and civilian gaming and things like this right now had their starts 15, 20 years ago, even further than that. So although it's a military-sponsored thing, it really was a project to say how can we learn how people use technology. So, um, you know, this could be the next Wii Remote. It's a little bigger than the one out on commercially available, and it's a little strange looking and funky looking, but that was part of the um, effort. We could have theoretically had hand handguns that shot water. Water pistols are, are little hand, I didn't want that. I wanted it to clearly be something that was a little ludicrous in size um, to, to take away the idea that it was shooting to kill. Didn't, we don't need to go anywhere near motivating youth to kill people in order to have something that's applicable to the Army, that's applicable to other research that's going on, that's applicable to game research for a pure fun entertainment point, point of view. We're pulling out just uh, also the training information and how we can use augmented reality for training, but you're also looking at what we got going on situation with the war is the post-traumatic syndrome. How can you use this stuff also to be able to do reconditioning, bring people back to society? How can you use this with the augmented reality for some person that has an amputee leg or an amputee arm to train him to be able to use those body parts in a non let's say a non-conditioned uh, or a situation where he's doing it in virtual reality instead of having to do it in the real and he's helping to train himself getting back in society. For kids without considerable gaming experience, there is a desktop version of the mixed reality environment which makes it easier to quickly get up to speed on the game challenge itself. Well up next, a beat the clock challenge and by that we mean creating a better clock. The list of firsts is lengthy and distinguished in the labs of Dr. Peter Delfiet. Among them, his team holds the record for the shortest and most intense pulse from a semiconductor laser diode. That's a critical component of accurate time and increasing data transmission. Dr. Delfiet holds 20 patents related to his research and is responsible for attracting millions of dollars in funding to UCF since joining the Center for Research and Education in Optics and Lasers, or CREOL. Let's talk light, Peter. I mean, uh, you have been doing so many things with the simple concept of light. And I say it's simple, but you've made it into something that is, is not only uh, more functional, but is improving our communications. You're working on uh, in encryption. You're, you're working on, on uh, I don't even know where to start exactly. Let, let's talk a little bit about kind of where we left off last time we chatted, which was, which was um, uh, modulating and changing and working with the speed of light, which right. in itself seems odd. Speed right. of light is a constant, isn't it? How right, can you right. The speed of light is, is constant, but the beauty about light is ha it has a property called bandwidth. And bandwidth is, in some sense, uh, the number of colors that you can contain within an optical signal. And the more colors you have in an optical signal, you can send more information through an optical fiber. And so as an example, uh, in a conventional commercially available optical fiber, you could send about 50 trillion bits of information per second uh, through an optical fiber, which is a tremendous amount of data. It would be analogous to um, probably uh, on the order of, of about, uh, uh, oh, maybe 10 million cable TV channels, uh, which is an enormous number, an enormous number. Uh, but that sort of gives you uh, some feeling in terms of the information carrying capacity of an optical fiber. So is it too simplistic to say that what you're doing is essentially working, uh, I think, of a light and a prism, for example, splitting it into various colors? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so what we do with uh, 
communication systems today is very much like what is done with radio systems, meaning that uh, in a conventional radio system, you will send music or, or vo uh, voice or uh, audio information on a particular carrier. So you tune your radio dial to a particular station, you hear some set of music. And if you want something different, you'll then tune it to another carrier. So what we do with light signals, we basically send information on, on different colors of light. And we put all of these colors together and send it down an optical fiber and at the back end we'll, we'll use a device like a prism to separate the individual colors so we d then we can effectively select out whatever information we'd like to listen to or to see or watch. I think in terms of the progression that I've seen just in the last 15-20 uh, years of uh, phone lines for example, okay they were just phone lines, well then they figured out well we could put more information in through those phone lines and DSL and other applications came on. Same with uh, cable. That's uh, right. We were talking a little bit about cable and, and how there was analog cable and then there was digital cable and they keep packing more and more channels in there. That's right. And, and essentially what you're doing is, is finding ways to put additional information into the existing infrastructure. That's right. One of the most important things that people are working on today, and we're working on this also in our group, is working on what we call the spectral efficiency. How can you make uh, this, the information capacity information carrying capacity of a fiber better. For example, you might think of the fiber as a pipe where you're sending water down the pipe and the pipe has a certain size. And so you can only get a certain amount of information through this pipe. And so at some particular point in time, you're going to use all the colors that fill the pipe and then so people are still going to be hungry for bandwidth and applications and the only way to, to, to make these applications a reality is you're going to have to somehow jam more information down the pipe. And so how do you do that if you've basically filled the pipe already? And so the, the way to do that is, is to improve the spectral efficiency. How can we send more information per unit time per uh, range of colors and improve that. For example, uh, when you turn, when uh, in commercially available communication systems, you turn the light on and off, ones and zeros. So we would call that system about 50% efficient. The light is on half the time, the light is off half the time. So it's 50% efficient. We're just sending two bits of information per unit time cycle. And so uh, is there a way that we could send three or four or five or six bits of information per clock cycle? And so in this way, uh, you'd be able to improve improve the spectral efficiency. So how can we do that? So one simple way might be to say instead of sending uh, a 1 and a 0 where 1 is represented by a flash of light and a 0 is represented by no flash of light, you might send a half. Well, what is a half? Well, it's not quite a, an extremely bright flash of light. It's a medium flash of light. Or another way of sending uh, multiple bits of information is to recognize that light is a wave and so a wave is like a little sine wave and then you can ask yourself when that wave comes in is it uh, the first peak, is it the trough, is it, is it the, the zero crossing of the, at the start of the first pe uh, peak or is it the second zero crossing so there are multiple regions on the sine wave that you can consider uh, the bit of information so within a sine wave there are kind of four regions or four bits of information that you could send by looking at a, a piece of a sine wave and so that would improve the spectral efficiency from instead of just uh, uh, 0.5 to a number of about two. So you'd improve the spectral efficiency by about a factor of four. And so that's enormous! That's enormous! For me, anyway. It, well, it is for all of us because we are all trying to do more on the internet. We're all trying to do more in terms of data exchange. And, and this plays also, I think, into, uh, from what we were discussing earlier, about encryption. I mean, you're trying to, to really I'll call it making it more dense, but essentially you're yeah. trying to do more things with that data. That's correct. And so to try and do more things with the data effectively will, will allow you to have applications such as um, today now people have something called Skype as an example, which is basically nothing more than the video telephone. Uh, and could you imagine if you had um, 300 million people within the U.S all uh, using some type of Skype application, which would be the norm. So instead of just using your cell phone or a regular landline, but everyone now wants to have, you know, voice and video. I got my Dick Tracy watch. Your Dick so Tracy talk watch. You know, yes. I was talking to someone a couple of years ago. I mean, Dick Tracy is, you know, 50 years old or more. And, and this is, in fact, now a reality. And so, but to make these things a reality, you really must work on technologies that allow you to, to, to com compress or pack more information uh, in an optical fiber than what we're able to today. This is uh, a, a very important, important thing folks are working on.
Now you've been working on, on, on various elements of research uh, uh, for, for a long, long time, but it, it's, it's been spilling out, uh, kind of bubbling to the top and spilling out in, in companies and projects and patents. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Radiance, one of the companies that spun out. That's right. Radiance is a company that uh, spun out of our laboratory uh, when the main idea of Radiance was to develop a laser system that could uh, deliver a tremendous amount of energy in an extremely short period of time. And this would allow this laser to effectively ablate or remove material without leaving heat behind. Normally, in most uh, laser systems that will cut and do things of that nature, they do it by basically melting. And so if you were to try and use this laser to uh, either cut you or to remove tattoos, it actually burns the skin off. And it actually hurts, and there's some amount of time required for the tissue to heal. Um, and so this uh, non-thermal ablation process is a way in which the optical radiation comes in, and literally it removes uh, the electrons within a time scale of about a trillionth of a second. And so what happens is, is that the atoms which are left behind wind up having a residual net positive charge, and they, and obviously, like charges do not like to be next to each other, and so they're just immediately expelled from the material. And so this process of uh, ablation allows you to remove material without the detrimental deposition of heat. And so what Radiance is now doing, they're using this process not for just uh, cleaning teeth or removing tattoos, but they're using it in, in novel types of micro-machining. And the most important thing that Radiance has done recently is they've been able to show that they can use this laser to machine extremely precise stents that will go inside arteries to help help doctors open up arteries to allow uh, blood to flow in a more, more easy fashion. The problem uh, with previous manufacturing technologies is that these stents are extremely fragile and, and hard to make and uh, hard to handle. And so if you're trying to t have a, a stent made of a very, very flimsy material and you're going to use something like a jigsaw to cut it so it allows it to bend, I mean, it'll just destroy the stent immediately. So if there's some way in which you can have a nice tiny device that can come in and physically drill out the material without, without destroying the stent, then you've got a winner. And Radiance has recently showed this and had a very nice news release within the past month uh, where they came out and showed that they could do this very nicely. I would like to find out if there's a way that you, you have an end point or are there discoveries made getting from point A to point B, if I make myself yes, clear. In other absolutely. words, you're working in communications, then you say, here's a detour that looks darn yes. interesting. Yes, this is typically what happens. Many times we'll start out you know, from point A and say, you know, we'd like to end up at point B. Maybe we're not really sure how we're going to get there, but we have a general idea. And then along the way, you'll wind up having new discoveries things that happen that will say, wow, we really need to take a detour and push in this particular direction. And when we do these things, we'll then file for intellectual property and patents, and then hopefully if things are successful in us, we're able to spin out companies like Radiance. And so, again, we don't necessarily plan to say, we're, we're going to do this. Uh, sometimes you're lucky enough to be able to do that, but many times it's, it's serendipity that's at work that allows you to make that happen. Do you have other tech transfer applications on the horizon here for other companies? Yes, yes. We're, uh, we're currently thinking about taking our frequency comb source, which is a, a laser that produces extremely well-precise timed optical pulses. It's basically an optical clock, along with a new type of modality or method that we've been able to develop to help modulate light and use these technologies for a new type of communications, what we're calling orthogonal frequency domain multiplexing. And this effect uh, or modality will allow you to send around maybe four or five bits of information, uh, bits per second per hertz, the spectral efficiency we were talking about before. So it's, a, it's almost about an order of magnitude, about ten times more than the conventional spectral efficiency that we have today. And this spin-out company is called ter uh, Terabyte Mining. And so hopefully uh, with those applications, we're looking at obtaining funding from certain agencies that, will, that are related to uh, homeland security and uh, computer security as an example. So the, the broad spectrum uh, of, of applications continues. And, and I wanted to kind of wrap things up a little bit by talking about uh, the, the optical clock. Uh, I, I know uh, from, from past discussions that uh, basically you, you've set all kinds of records uh, with, with uh, optical clocks. And again, I think most people just in passing that don't know anything about lasers, including myself, will say, oh, optical clock, I mean, how accurate how can accurate you get? Can Why is it so important to be right. this precise? Right. And yet you continue to make that almost a, a focal point some aspects of your work. Right. Um, yes, it's, it's true. I mean, many things that we do as researchers, we always try to make things 
uh, better and more precise. It turns out that our optical clock now runs with a precision uh, of about uh, 380 attoseconds, and an attosecond is 10 to the minus 18 seconds. And so what does this effectively mean? It means that uh, this clock that we have, it puts out pulses uh, about 10 billion pulses per second. And if you took a look at the first pulse and then the last pulse, 10 billion pulses away, and in one second that would be about 186,000 miles apart, that that last pulse is out of position according to God's clock of about uh, 300 times 10 to the minus 18 seconds. It's about, about a tenth of the wavelength of light, of inaccuracy. Now, uh, because of that, um, these pulses which come out so regular that, again, it produces a, a spectrum of colors which are so precise that you now are able to use these, this as a measurement tool for metrology. And so one is envisioning using these optical frequency combs or clocks in manufacturing applications where the precision of manufacturing components might actually need to be on the order of 100 nanometers or more. This gets into the domain of, of nanotechnology and how, you, how can you precisely manufacture, manufacture items with precisions on the order of, of size of a few atoms, but do this uh, regularly uh, in a controlled fashion at independent manufacturing sites worldwide. And it's this frequency comb or clock that's going to make that a reality. Fascinating. Uh, it's so many different areas and so much to talk about. We must have you back again much sooner than we have in, had in the past. Peter Delphia, thank you so much for coming by and joining us today. On it's my pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you, and sir. And you stay right there. We have just a few moments left, but always enough for our Research Minute. Well, we've been studying these nanoparticles for a couple of years, uh, funded uh, by the NSF and the NIH, and we found that they're very efficient uh, radical scavengers of superoxide. They are uh, unique in terms of how they can be distributed through the body. Nanoparticles, by definition, are smaller generally than proteins that we see. So we have actually some preliminary data that they can distribute throughout cells. So we think that com the combination of their distribution in tissue and in animals and potentially in the future um, with, combined with their antioxidant uh, activity could be a unique combination to treat uh, disease or, or states that, that involve reactive oxygen species. Yeah. Part of the, the mechanism of inflammation is the production of reactive oxygen species. So we, um, we're looking more in terms of how they might be uh, anti-inflammatory through their radical scavenging properties. Uh, this is sort of where we're going to going now. The mission of the Office of Technology Transfer at the University of Central Florida is to proactively facilitate the transfer of technology from the university to the commercial sector through enlightened technology transfer policies, processes that efficiently and effectively reduce off-the-shelf technology inventory, and dedication to customers and being easy to do business with. Our guiding principles are development of intellectual property assets, licensing them into the commercial sector, which leads to a return on investment for the university. We envision an eventual contribution to the economic development within the Central Florida region, the state, and the nation. UCF will be recognized as a contributor and leader in the future economic performance of the Central Florida region. We may have a laser clock, but time has still run out for this edition of Zenith. The goal of research is to better understand the world around us. Our goal is to be a window to that world. Until next time, I'm Ed Highland for Zenith.